So, which bond did we say proteins will typically use for that secondary structure of the, the alpha helices and the beta sheets? Which bonds? Hydrogen bonds. Now, are those the strongest bonds? The weakest. What's one way that we, in fact, can break hydrogen bonds in the kitchen? Heat. Apply heat energy. So it makes sense that if you cook an enzyme, which is what type of macromolecule? A protein. You start to break those chemical bonds and you can denature the enzyme. You denature the enzyme, which means changing the shape. You've lost that whole active site shape. You've changed where the amino acid. You're not going to have any enzyme function. Now, if you make it too cold, that molecule is going to tighten up. So there's an optimal temperature for our enzymes. And the same with pH. If you're too acidic or too basic, you're going to denature the protein and you're going to lose enzyme function. So temperature and pH is another way within which you could regulate enzyme activity. Now, you as a health practitioner are going to encounter this more often in your settings than you would necessarily the other two because there are a lot of pharmacologic agents, a lot of drugs that you will provide to the patient that their mode of operation, the mechanism through which they're helping the patient, is called competitive inhibition. Another word for a competitive inhibitor is a blocker. And so in this case, in our illustration, we have an enzyme. And it is binding to its substrate, the red molecules we see here, breaking them in half. That's normally what it does. But we also have the drug in blue, the competitive inhibitor. Now, what's the first thing you notice about the number of the inhibitors versus the number of substrates? There's more inhibitor. So if you're competing for the binding site and there's vastly more inhibitor around than substrate, statistically speaking, who's most likely to bind? The inhibitor. The inhibitor is going to bind, and it binds in such a way that it doesn't activate the enzyme. It's not cleaved but it prevents the substrate from binding, and so the reaction slows down or stops. So you see how drugs mimic the shape of the actual natural product? And in that way, you can slow or stop a chemical reaction. <clears throat> now, we're going to spend a little bit of time here because this is, uh, uh, as far as regulation goes, this is probably the most difficult concept to understand. So we're going to start over here on the left-hand side. We have two different reactions and two different enzymes that are regulated in different ways, one across the top and one across the bottom. At the top, we have an enzyme that is active, and we need to regulate it so that it stops. And on the bottom, it's the opposite. We have an enzyme that is turned off, and we need to somehow turn that enzyme on to process the substrate into product. Now, the way this happens is by using molecules that can interact and bind to the enzyme in a different place other than the active site. Let me say that one more time because that's key. In the previous slide, our competitive inhibition, the blocker was binding at the active site. The substrate couldn't get in. Here, we're talking about a regulatory site on the enzyme that is different from the active site. The active site's still available. It's still open. It's still unchanged. And this additional regulatory site on the enzyme that can bind these regulatory factors is called the allosteric site. Allo as a prefix means different. So in your clinical setting, when you have a patient that has had a kidney transplant, that was called an allo graft. Because did that kidney come from your patient? No, it came from someone else, so it's different. 
if someone gives their own blood before a surgery and they get their own blood back, that would be an autograft. They're getting their same tissue. Oftentimes, skin grafts are taken from a different location on a patient. That is an autograft. But if it's coming from someone else, it's aloe. So aloe automatically tells you different, and what it's different from is from the active site. Do we all understand that? So in our illustration, the active site is at the bottom, and the allosteric site is at the top, those two pockets. Yes, ma'am? Um, what is it that the active site is on? Okay, this, the purple thing is the enzyme. The purple is the enzyme, the, I don't know, what color is that? Red? The red little capsule is the substrate, and in this case, the blue are the products. So, here we've got an active enzyme. Binds a substrate, produces products. We need to turn the enzyme off. So think of the allosteric site as a lock or a mechanism in which you turn a key that can turn it on or off. In this case, we have to put in a key to shut it off. And here we have a repressor molecule that binds and it has to have the specific shape and the specific activity such that the binding of this repressor changes the shape of the active site such that you can't process any more substrate. Do you see how we turn the enzyme off? We didn't block the active site, but the other molecule called it to change, so it stopped its activity. <coughs> well, uh, you may have produced enough of whatever you're producing. And your body is not going to work any harder than it has to. It's not. Because energy is valuable. That's why if you have a patient that's on bed rest, what's going to happen to their muscles? They're going to atrophy. Why? Muscles are energetically expensive to maintain. And if you're not using them, your body says, I'm not wasting my energy. So let's just get rid of this muscle. If they're not going to use it, we won't have to pay so much in the way of ATP. Now, the bottom, we have an enzyme that's off. Maybe we desperately need those products to build up more muscle. So in this case, the way we turn this enzyme on is to a different molecule. Do you see how it's a different shape? I wish they had made it a different color. This particular molecule can bind to the allosteric site for this enzyme to open the active site for business so now it can facilitate the reaction and produce product. That's allosteric regulation, and many of your pharmacologics are moving in this direction not necessarily to be competitive inhibitors, but to mimic allosteric molecules to turn these enzymes on or off, pharmacologically. Now the last modification is covalent. Now covalent's a bond, right? We had hydrogen, covalent, what was our other one? Ionic. Covalent bonds, We. that's the strongest one. So here we're making some fairly permanent changes. They're not just going to pop on or pop off. And the two types of covalent modifications I want you to know about, because they are very common, is the process with which we use enzymes called kinases. Now, this is one of those that you go, okay, ACE is an enzyme kind. What in the world kind kind of molecule? That doesn't make sense. Well, this is one you have to commit to memory. Because a kinase adds a phosphate group to a protein. This is like an on-off switch for some of the enzymes. So some enzymes you turn on by adding a phosphate, others you turn off by adding a phosphate, but it's like a switch. And the addition of a phosphate group is facilitated by a kinase. <coughs> now, if you put the phosphate on, you gotta have a way to get it off. And that set of enzymes are called phosphatases, which makes more sense. Ace, phospho, you're taking off the phosphate group. Because again, that's a way to turn an enzyme either on or off. It depends on the particular enzyme. And the reason we talk about phosphates, it's a great means with which to signal but there's also another utility in phosphate groups and specifically the chemical bond between phosphate groups because where do our cells get most of their energy from? 
What's that molecule that's the energy currency of all of our cells? ATP. What's the P stand for? Phosphate. And you have three of them. So when you look at metabolism and how cells work, you're going to see that we have two molecules, adenine diphosphate. And when you take ADP, you apply energy, and you get a hold of a free phosphate using enzymes. And what enzyme is going to stick the phosphate on to ADP? A kinase. That's how you convert ADP into ATP. Now, to release the energy and to remove the phosphate in the process, what enzyme? Phosphatase. And this is just the ATP cycle. If you're putting energy into this reaction of converting ADP to ATP, what kind of gonic reaction is that? Energy in, endergonic. See, in, ender sounds the same. But here we're releasing the energy, or the energy is exiting. What kind of gonic is that? Exergonic. And again, you have those two very specific enzymes that are doing that and facilitating those processes. So this leads us to the beginning of cellular respiration. We're not going to have a ton of chemical reactions here. We're not going to learn a lot of intermediates in this process, much like the science majors do. It's just too much for the time we have to cover. But there's some foundational and basic understandings about energy that we have to get down and we have to know. Not the least of which is enzymes are all a part of what's about to happen. That's why we talked about enzymes. The transfer of energy. It's all about what we're going to talk about with aerobic respiration or even anaerobic for that matter. And the production of ATP. Because that's what cellular respiration is all about. The conversion of energy and the raw materials that you have consumed and taking that energy and storing it in a form that all of our cells can use, namely ATP. So we wrap this process in a nice package that we call cellular respiration. And cellular respiration, by and large, is going to occur in the mitochondria, except for the very first part. And the very first stage is called glycolysis. That happens in the cytoplasm of the cell. Let me repeat that. And you know what that means when I repeat stuff. Of the stages of respiration, glycolysis, the first one, happens in the cytoplasm. And as the name implies... Glycolysis, if you just broke that word down, what would you guess that word means? Glucose breaking. And in this first step of glycolysis, what we're going to see is we take one glucose molecule that has how many carbons? Six. Six. And we're going to break it into two three-carbon molecules. One of the reasons we're going to do that is glucose is too big to go into the next factory where we're going to continue to release and recover energy, that being the mitochondria. So if we can't get the big glucose in, we're going to get into two smaller parts of it. Have you ever done that, tried to move furniture into an apartment or a dorm? You can't get the whole thing in, so you take, take it apart. If you go to Ikea and you get some of those assembled deals... You don't put it together and then take it in. You just carry a piece at a time in. Then you've got to think about, oh, if I move, how am I going to get it out? Right? So that's what's happening in glycolysis. The other stages are happening in certain compartments or on certain membranes of the mitochondria because the mitochondria is the what of the cell? The powerhouse of the cell. It's producing ATP. Now, we do have a little bit 
extra that we're going to divide this last one into, but we'll, we'll get to that. And we're probably going to get to that on Friday. And let me go ahead and say here too, we will probably, most likely, not spend the entire time Friday covering material for the test. Which means whatever time we have left over Friday will be a Q&A time. You bring your questions. It's not going to be a review per se. I'm not going to re-lecture on stuff. But you bring your questions. And the way I typically do my Q&A, when you have a question, I'm going to let other members of the class help answer. I'm only here to sort of be a referee and make sure it's all corrected. Because the way you learn is be an active part of the process. So bring your questions and bring your answers. Okay? And do not be surprised if somebody has a question that I call on someone to come to the board and illustrate instead of me having to draw because I stink at drawing. But again, that's the way to get you involved in the process. Okay? I'm not going to embarrass anybody, so don't be, don't be scared. Okay? So, cellular respiration. As we break down the compartments, again, we have number one, glycolysis, trying to illustrate the cytoplasm. This cell is certainly not drawn to scale because a mitochondria is not that big, but this is what they're illustrating here with the mitochondria. The mitochondria has two membranes, and we'll cover that a little bit more. We have an outer membrane, an inner membrane, a small space between the two membranes, and then a very large internal membrane. It's called the matrix. Not like the movie, but the space. But again, with this one, you can begin to see these yellow starbursts trying to illustrate the production of ATP. And the energy we're using to make the ATPs coming from those chemical bonds of glucose as we break them down. So we're going to refer back to this and we're going to do quite a bit of accounting to keep up with the ATPs and we're going to keep up with the carbons. Those are the two important things we're going to keep up with as we break down the glucose. So here are our stages. This is going to be our energy recovered stage. And we say this is a substrate level, meaning we're using enzymes. And so our substrate level is going to include glycolysis, this intermediate stage, which we'll explain when we get there. And then the citric acid cycle that goes by three names. You can either call it the TCA cycle, the citric acid cycle, or the Krebs cycle. Doesn't matter to me which name you use on the test because they all mean the same thing. They're all correct. But then we also have what I like to think of as the energy transformed step. We're recovering the energy here, but we're transforming it into ATP and the bulk of our ATP is going to be part of our electron transport system, but the part that they didn't have in that slide that I really want to add and make sure you understand is this last part, oxidative phosphorylation. You've got to use oxygen, and this is where we're going to use that phosphate to attach it to the ADP. And how cells do this at the end, it is amazing, it is super cool. And I'm nerding out on you, I know, but it is. To think the cells can, can do this, it's, it's just mind-blowing. So glycolysis, we're going to start here first. Glycolysis, glucose gets transported into the cell. What hormone is going to be one that will help get glucose into our cells? See, I asked that question in a different way. Because I've been asking the question, what hormone reduces your blood sugar level? Which one is that one? Insulin. Insulin. But you see how I worded it differently. And because I worded it differently, that's going to trip up those people that are just memorizing words and don't really understand what it means. My test wants to know if you understand what everything means. So, again... What hormone decreases your blood sugar level by getting it into the cells versus what hormone is going to help get glucose into the cell? The answer to both of those is insulin. But once we get glucose in, in the cytoplasm of the cell, 
We have a set of enzymes and we have a number of steps. But the synopsis of what is happening here, we're taking our glucose molecule. How many carbons? Six. And we're producing two molecules that are called pyruvate. And how many carbons do they have? Three. Again, do some accounting, keep up with the carbons. That's how we're going to do this. But in the process of glycolysis, we are producing two molecules of ATP that we didn't have before. The net product of glycolysis is two molecules of ATP. I'm saying net, and please don't let this confuse you, because glycolysis actually produces four molecules of ATP, but there's a step in the middle, well, kind of more toward the front of glycolysis, where you actually have to use two ATPs. So you see, that's why we say net. The gross production of glycolysis is four, but since you had to invest two in the beginning, your net output per glucose in glycolysis is two. All right. All right, so we're going to make, not make, we're going to recover our energy from glucose, right? This is our cellular respiration. And so we got almost to the end of our first stage of cellular respiration, which is glycolysis. And as we're doing this and you look at the word glycolysis, what does the word literally mean? Breaking Glucose, you're breaking glucose. We're recovering the energy that's bonding those carbons together. So glycolysis is the first stage of respiration. Where does glycolysis specifically occur inside the cell? In the cytoplasm. Now that might be a little tricky, right? Because where do you produce the energy? In the mitochondria, but we haven't gotten there yet. And part of the reason is glucose is too big to be transported into the mitochondria, so you've got to break it in half first. And so glycolysis breaks our six-carbon glucose into two pyruvate molecules, and each one of those have how many carbons? Three. Now, keeping up with the carbons and keeping up with the ATP, it's like accounting. That's going to help you as we go through this. And so far, we haven't made any CO2, so all the carbons are still wrapped up in our molecules of pyruvate. But don't forget, we've already produced some ATP. That's our energy currency. And we've got these other things called NADH. Now, I want to talk about that just a little bit. NAD, nicotine adenine dinucleotide, big fancy name. You just need NAD, okay? But notice what comes after NAD down here at the bottom. What is that? A plus. NAD is charged. NAD is an ion. What if NAD is positive, what is it missing? An electron, exactly. So NAD, it's one of the most common electron transporters that we have in our cells. NAD and another molecule that we're going to see when we get to the TCA cycle, they're electron transporters. Sometimes they're called cofactors. And so as we break down glucose, we're going to produce a little bit of ATP. Using enzymes, this is our substrate level production of ATP. But the biggest thing that we are going to produce and capture and transport are going to be electrons. And when we capture the electrons, we convert NAD into NADH. And that H is going to help glue the electron on to NAD. Did you have a question? Okay. <coughs> So as we look at our products of glycolysis, again, doing our accounting, we make two of everything. 
And these are our net products. So two ATP, two pyruvate, two NADHs. That's an easy way to remember those products. They're just double of everything. But remember we also said with ATP, because we have to use two ATP to sort of get the process started, we actually produce four. But since we had to use two, our net, you understand the difference here between the gross and the net? What we have to take to the bank is only two ATP. And so that's glycolysis, our first stage. Now, don't panic. I know we've got some sort of chemical-looking structures and things, but again, look at the blue carbons. That's the important thing. As we break glucose into intermediate molecules, some of these intermediate molecules, we're going to stick phosphates on. See, we took ATP, those two ATP, and we added phosphates to those molecules. What enzyme do we know adds phosphates to molecules? It's got to be an ACE because it's an enzyme. Can you remember the first name? Kinase. K-I-N-ACE. Kinase. So we've got kinase enzymes adding those phosphates. That's why we use the ATP. That's going to be important because the next set of enzymes only recognizes these three carbon molecules with a phosphate attached. And in that next step, that's where we are going to convert those intermediates and recover electrons. Then in the next step, we have to add two more phosphates. Now, actually, here we're going to be making some ATP, so we're taking those phosphates off. And then in the next step, we're taking the phosphates off. Now, what enzymes remove phosphate groups? Kinases add what removes? Phosphatases. Again, you got the ACE, this one of phosphates being removed. So that name's a little bit easier to remember than kinases. So do you see how even though we've got this nice little simple box, it's not quite that simple. But what do you need to remember for the exam? That right there. Hopefully just following the chemical process helps you understand a little better about at different stages different things are happening. All right? So we've got two of everything after glycolysis. Now let's look at pyruvate. We have pyruvate out in the cytoplasm. Pyruvate's this three carbon molecule. <clears throat> now have we used oxygen at all yet? No. We've not used oxygen at all. So we talk about cellular respiration and a lot of times we talk about this as the beginning of aerobic respiration and by and large it is. But glycolysis is also the beginning of anaerobic respiration when there's not sufficient oxygen around to finish off that process. So we can either take pyruvate and follow an aerobic pathway, and that aerobic pathway is going to take us into the TCA cycle, or if there's not a lot of oxygen around, because TCA and the electron transport requires oxygen at the end, we can go through the anaerobic pathway to a process called fermentation. Now for humans, that fermentation pathway leads to lactate. What's another name for lactate? Lactic acid. For those that work out or for those that do something really strenuous when your muscles get sore, what caused that? Lactic acid. And the harder you work and the more sore your muscles become, that means the more lactic acid you produced. Because when you're working really, really hard, what is your respiratory rate doing? It's going faster and faster. You're breathing hard. And when you're doing extremely strenuous exercise, you can't do that for a long period of time. You have to slow down. Because your body has moved into this state of anaerobic respiration, you're not producing a lot of energy, you're building up a lot of lactic acid, and so your muscles aren't working efficiently, and finally you just, your body just says, I'm done, you hit the wall, and your muscles just won't do it anymore. Now, most of our energy in glucose, if we have to go through fermentation, most of that energy is still stored in the lactate molecule. 
And so you may think, well, why even do that? We're only getting two ATP so far because we're not making any ATP when we convert pyruvate to lactate. But what you're doing is you're moving the pyruvate off the assembly line so glycolysis can still occur. Because which is better? No energy or some energy? Some. You don't have oxygen, so you're not going to make a bunch. So that's why you still undergo fermentation so you can produce even a little bit, which is two, rather than the whole thing shutting down and you producing zero amount of ATP. So with creatine, we're, we're going to get into that a little bit in our muscle chapter, but creatine is, um, it's an, Think of it as a secret bank account because the ADP and the ATP, what's the difference between ADP and ATP? One phosphate. And that high energy bond between that second and third phosphate, that's where the energy is stored. Creatine lives in your muscle. And when there's an abundant supply of ATP and energy around, some of that phosphate gets transferred from ATP to creatine. And creatine becomes what? Creatine phosphate. Those are the two separate forms. And so it's like a separate little bank account that you put some money, you stash it away in so that you can build up more ATP. So when your muscles burn through ATP, creatine phosphate says, hey, I've got a little bit of extra. You need some help. And so that's what that does. It gives you a little bit longer uh, boost of energy, uh, a little bit more stamina, but that's not going to last forever either. So that's what the creatine does. We'll talk more about that in the muscle, muscle part. So aerobic respiration goes TCA, we're going to produce a ton. Fermentation leads to lactate, and really that pathway is just so we can unclog the pyruvate and keep glycolysis going. And as glycolysis runs for every molecule of glucose, how many ATP are we going to net recover? Two. Two and only two from glycolysis, forever and always. All right, so we got plenty of oxygen. Now we're going to import the pyruvate into the mitochondria. And we're going to go to this next step. It's called an intermediate stage. And basically, we're simply converting the pyruvate into a suitable molecule to get it into the TCA cycle. And so during the intermediate stage, we're going to take each pyruvate. So remember we have two of those now. Each one of those is going to go separately through the TCA cycle. So this sometimes messes with your accounting because you just think of this one process, but now you've got to do it twice. So for each pyruvate that has three carbons, at the end of our intermediate stage, we are going to have one acetyl-CoA molecule that only has two carbons. Oops, where did that carbon go? We ripped the carbon off, and we produced a CO2 molecule per pyruvate. Now, we're also going to recover some more electrons, right? NAD becomes NADH. We got more electrons. This is per pyruvate. But how many pyruvates do we make from glucose? Two. So when we look at the net products of the intermediate stage per glucose, we have two more NADHs, we have two acetyl-CoA that each have two carbons, keep up with the carbons, remember, and then we have two CO2 produced. So we got rid of two carbons with the CO2. How many carbons do we have left to play with from the glucose? Four. See, this is where the accounting gets tough because we have two in each acetyl-CoA, but we have two of them. So there's still four carbons left in the system because the CO2 gets spit out. Well, when we start with a glucose molecule, remember the six carbons, we break it into pyruvates, right? Two, three carbon pyruvates. Now when we get to the intermediate stage, we rip a carbon off of each one of those and have two acetyl-CoA. That's what's left from the original six carbon glucose. All right? Yeah, we, they're gone now. 
We're not going to do anything else to those. We, we exhale those. All right? And plants pick them back up and assimilate them back into glucose. So now we've gone through glycolysis. We've gone through the intermediate stage. Now the molecules that enter the citric acid cycle, the TCA cycle, are those acetyl-CoA molecules each containing the two carbons. And here we, you can see our pyruvate acetyl-CoA and we plug it into this cycle. Now we call it a cycle because these carbons are coming around and as they do, we end up with a molecule that's called OAA. OAA is sufficient for you. Its big name is oxaloacetate. How many carbons does acetyl-CoA have? Two. Oxaloacetate has four carbons. And when you bring acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate together, you first produce a six-carbon molecule called citrate or citric acid. And that's the first step that we see in our TCA cycle, that as we come around, we're going to produce some more CO2. We're going to capture some more electrons in our NAD. But here's our other electron transporter, FADH2. NADH, FADH2. You need to know them as electron transporters, electron carriers. That's all they do. But we also get a little bit more ATP for our citric acid cycle. So let's go back to our accounting. So per acetyl-CoA molecule, we take that two-carbon molecule, link it together with OAA, oxaloacetate, and we make citrate. Then as we go through the cycle, <coughs> we're going to break each acetyl-CoA with two carbons down into two CO2 molecules. So we completely eliminate now those carbons that came into the system from the uh, acetyl-CoA. We also make a molecule of FADH2, three molecules of NADH, so most of those electrons are there, and one more molecule of ATP. So, again, per glucose molecule, the TCA cycle, here are our numbers. We have eight of our electron transporters. We have the last four carbons from our glucose are eliminated as CO2 and we add in two more ATP. So glucose is gone. All those carbons we brought in, we breathe them out. They've been eliminated. Y'all are typing. I'm going to get my coffee. Do you see how, though, this is, this is accounting? This is bookkeeping? All right, we're, we're getting close to the end of having to do that because, again, our carbons are gone. So as we put our accounting numbers together, Remember our energy recovered stages, our substrate level stages, glycolysis, two ATP, two NADHs. I'm not listing the pyruvate there. Intermediate stage, two more NADHs and two CO2s. TCA cycle, two ATP, six NADHs, two FADH2s and four CO2s. So, so far, we have only net recovered four ATP molecules. But in fact, when you look at all of the electron transporters we have, how many electron transporters have we recovered all together so far? I don't know if you can see that number, 10. So, here, here's the take-home message from these first three stages. Most of the energy from the glucose after the first three stages. 
most of the energy from the glucose recovered in those first three stages exists in the form of electrons. Most of the energy from glucose exists in the form of the electrons. Because we've only, we've only made 4 ATP. That's not a lot. So now that we have this energy in these electron transporters, we have to recover the energy and transform the energy from those electron transporters and get them into what form? What form do we ultimately want our energy in? ATP. And that's going to be the next stage, which is our electron transport system. And then remember, I added that last little bit, oxidative phosphorylation. Now, earlier in the semester when we talked about gradients of ions, do you remember we did that? What did I compare that potential energy and electron gradients to? Like for water and producing electricity. The hydroelectric dam. This is exactly what we're going to do with our electrons. I mean, practically the exact same thing, simply at the molecular level. And somebody had a question. Who had a question? Yes, ma'am. Most of our energy that we're recovering from glucose after the TCA cycle, so after those first three stages, exists in the form of electrons. They're tied up with NADH and FADH2. So now you can think of them as energy carriers, but what they really carry are the electrons. And we have to make our ATP from them. Now we're going to spend a lot more time next chapter about organelles, but we have to understand some fundamentals about the mitochondria before we move into this next portion about electron transport. Our mitochondria has two membranes. The outer membrane is going to be like the skin on a capsule. The inner membrane is all folded up into these ridges called cristae. But by having these two membranes, you have two compartments inside the mitochondria. You have a space between the outer membrane and the inner membrane. They refer to that as the intermembrane space or the outer compartment. And then you have the space at the very center, which is often called the matrix, or think of it as the very inner compartment of mitochondria. So do you see how the membranes have divided the inside into inner and outer? And then we've got that inner membrane kind of curving around. Now, when you see things folded up in nature, cell biology, and anatomy, what is being increased when you fold things? Surface area. And the reason that's critical for the inner membrane of our mitochondria, this is where we have all the proteins and the enzymes that are going to be used to transport electrons and convert that electron energy into ATP. And the more surface area you have for those proteins to exist on, the more of those factories you can have. Because what do mitochondria do? Produce energy. They're the powerhouses of the cell. <coughs> so here's a different synopsis of respiration. We've got glucose and pyruvate, which is glycolysis, happening where? Cytoplasm. Pyruvate gets imported. Here we have our intermediate step, producing acetyl-CoA. There's our TCA cycle, producing predominantly all of these electron transporters. Now these electron transporters are going to interact with these molecules on that inner membrane of the mitochondria. This little red line that you see, they're trying to show the transfer of electrons from one to two to three on down this chain of proteins. And as electrons get transported along that chain, the energy of those electrons is going to cause these proteins to pump hydrogen ions, protons, out into this Inner, this uh, outer space between the inner membrane and the outer membrane, do you see how that's building up? You see all those H's in that outer space? That's like water behind the dam. 
Now that inner membrane of the mitochondria, that's the dam with all those hydrogen ions built up. And the very last thing that happens is those hydrogen ions are allowed to flow back through different enzymes that are called ATP synthase. There's the ACE, the enzyme name. What do you think those enzymes make? ATP. So it's the energy of that potential, that gradient of protons, as they flow through these, those enzymes actually spin like turbines in a dam producing electricity. These things spin around. They take an ADP and a phosphate, and as they spin because of that energy of the protons flowing through, that sticks the phosphate to ADP, and ATP is formed, and it falls off. That's how we're going to do it. That's the nutshell of electron transport. Qu somebody had a question? Um, what did you say was causing the buildup? Because, uh, okay, that was an overview. We're going to step through it. Okay. So if we get to the end and you're still not sure, ask, ask me that again. Okay. okay? So first, here is our inner membrane of the mitochondria. This is the space between our inner and outer membranes, and this is the inside, the matrix. All those electron transporters, the NADs and the FADHs, they bring their electrons to these electron transport molecules. And do you see how the electrons, the negative, how it gets transported along? The positive hydrogen ions get transported out. You see that? So the power of the electrons, that energy, is converted into a proton gradient that potential energy of protons. And that's the whole point of these electrons and transporting them to pump, pump the protons out into that space to build up water behind the dam. Now, do you remember how we call this aerobic respiration? And when you say aerobic respiration, what molecule are you thinking about? Oxygen. Right at the very end of the process, an oxygen molecule comes in. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor. And when oxygen comes in and takes hold of that electron at the very end of the electron transport chain, it produces a molecule of water. If oxygen is not there, when the electron gets to the end of the line, the electron stops, the whole electron transport chain stops, and you make no more energy. You see? That's why we have to have that backup called fermentation and the production of lactic acid. Because you're not going to produce any more energy if you don't have enough oxygen show up here at the very end right there to take that electron away and keep going. So that's why we call it aerobic respiration. So now we've got all of our hydrogens built up in the space between the inner and outer membrane. Here is our ATP synthase enzyme. Do you see how it's spinning? And so as this spins because of the hydrogens flowing through, that spinning action actually takes the ADP and the phosphate, locks them into a pocket, and as this thing spins around, you produce ATP. Just like that hydroelectric dam where you're making electricity. It's crazy that somehow biology and nature came up with this plan thousands or millions of years before we ever built the first dam to make electricity. But it's the same principle. And that provides us power for our body just like those dams provide power so that we can have lights and electricity. So this is the oxidative phosphorylation step where we're sticking that phosphate on, <coughs> excuse me, phosphate on the ADP to produce ATP. Now, remember where I said all of our energy was stored? When we took our glucose and went through those first three steps, was most of our energy in those four ATP? Where, where was most of the energy? The electrons and the electron transporters. So here again, NAD, that red is showing the electrons. 
Here are all of our hydrogen protons getting pumped out. And as they flow back through our ATP synthase, that's where we take the ADP and the phosphate to make more ATP. The question is how much ATP is being produced by this process? Because glucose has a lot of energy in it. And as glucose produces this energy, and as our cells burn this energy, then we set up this cycle where, okay, we're making the ATP, it comes out to the cell, the cell uses the ATP, like your cardiac muscle that's beating, and using up that ATP, producing and converting it to ADP and phosphate, that gets transported back in and it sets up this cycle, this repeated cycle of doing this again and again so our cells can function, maintain homeostasis. But this is gonna require that we have a lot of ATP. And frankly, your heart doesn't work without oxygen. If you deprive your heart of oxygen, what's going to happen? Heart attack. Yeah, and if it's a massive heart attack, you're going to die. It's not going to be a happy day. So we've got to have a lot of energy. So with all of our bookkeeping that we've done so far, through those first three steps, we produce four ATP. This is where we finish it off and we look at it. Glycolysis, two ATP. Krebs cycle, two more ATP. Remember I said the, elect the energy was in the electrons? We recover in the electron transport oxidative phosphorylation step approximately 34 molecules of ATP. That's where we make the difference. That's how those electron transporters are so important. So, with our accounting, we take a glucose molecule. We take six molecules of oxygen because this is aerobic respiration. We're going to yield six CO2 molecules because we're getting rid of our six carbons. We produce six molecules of water, and that's as oxygen accepts those electrons. But how many ATP total do we make in oxidative, I mean, in cellular respiration? 38. That's the number to remember. 38 molecules of ATP are produced per glucose molecule through aerobic respiration. That was a long way to go to get the 38 ATP. And trust me, there are a lot more steps and enzymes involved in that, but that's really the take-home message. That's why glucose is so important to us. The energy in those 38 ATP molecules, where did it originally come from? We got it out of glucose, but that's not where it originated. Where does all energy originate? The sun. Because there's a plant somewhere that captured that sun to make that glucose and assimilate the energy into those six carbon bonds that we had to make up our glucose, but we're really recovering sunlight, if you want to think of it like that, for our energy. All right, questions, that's it for the test. Yes, ma'am.